Hi, I'm Nick Thomas, instructor at the Academy of Historical Fencing. A HEMA instructor, but I'm here to talk to you here today about a Japanese sword, the katana, also known by many as the samurai sword. Um, this particular one is a modern reproduction made by Hamway, but I'm here to use this as a prop today, not so much a review. Um, why am I talking about the katana, as we are a European martial arts school? Well, lots of reasons really. One, um, it's a subject that's fascinated a lot of people, and they always want to know how does it really compare to European swords, to the sort of swords that are uh, about our own heritage in Europe? Um, how good is it? How fast is it? All these different questions to answer. I will post videos at a later date that looks at the katana versus specific European swords, such as longsword, rapier and sabre, because the katana had a very long service life. However, we're going to look today at an overview of the whole sort of subject. So, the first of all, the first thing you want to look at is movie representations. The katana's been in an awful lot of movies. Uh, now, if you want to look at comparisons, and you want to have some fun comparisons, you look at something like Highlander or The Ring of Steel, where they pitch katana versus, you know, big sort of European long swords or, or rapiers in the case of Ring of Steel, they are immensely entertaining and I recommend you watch them. But don't take anything else from them because they are appalling as far as actual swordsmanship goes. Um, so we're now actually going to look at the weapon itself. Um, first of all, I'm always going to be looking at how this compares to European swords, that's the point of the video. Um, weight. There is an idea that a lot of people have that the katana is especially light and that European swords are particularly heavy and unwieldy. And that is a myth largely spread throughout the 19th century which is spread into the 20th. If you look at um, Japanese swords compared to European, proportionally they are about of the same weight. So you're typically going to find European swords are a little bit longer. There are equivalent Japanese swords of the same length, but in the number of them, average, Japanese swords are going to be a bit smaller. But if you convey like for like, they're a similar weight, and if you want to look at them proportionally, they're going to be, again, of about the same weight. So what does a katana weigh? Well, it did vary a lot throughout the time period it was used, but you can typically say something in the region of the very light end, around about six to 700 grams, and ranging up to about 1.2 kilos. Now, when a European longsword tends to be in the range of 1.1 to 1.5 kilos, and you know that it's about 30% larger as an actual overall size, average, then again, proportionally, they're coming out at about the same. And again, for uh, military sabres, for example, well, an infantry sabre tends to weigh 850 grams, so it's katana range, uh, rapiers, just over a kilo, uh, which again, they're massive compared to the most katanas. So that's an idea of, um, of weight. So overall, not a lot of difference, uh, at least in proportion. The um, next thing is sharpness. There is a, a sort of an idea with the katana that it, they are razor sharp, and you see them sort of cutting through absolutely anything. And you will even see documentaries, um, things like sort of Discovery Channel documentaries, that will claim that they can cut through plate armor. And there's an idea that uh, if sort of a katana was pitted up against a, a knight, a European knight, instead of full plate armor, full harness. That it would just cut through the armour. That is absolute nonsense. The katana is no better at cutting through armour than a European sword that is, well, in use at the same time. Swords were not used to cut against armour, except some extreme cases of things like falchions where they move towards being more blunt force trauma than just an actual cutting edge. But as far as you compare a katana to, say, a European longsword, neither is at all good at cutting an armour. You don't cut against armour, except in Lord of the Rings. Um, it does not work well. Against armour you need to use thrusting techniques or blunt force trauma instruments. So, <clears throat> is the katana sharper than a European sword? Well, they tend to be harder, so they can maintain a, a, an edge for longer. A European sword can be sharpened to the same level, but the katana, yes, will hold that edge for longer. Um, but no, they're not inherently sharper than European swords. Uh, in terms of durability, uh, again, a lot of documentaries will have you sort of talking about katanas cutting through other swords. Um, that one, again, is a bit of a myth. Um, swords broken combat. Japanese swords broken combat. European swords broken combat. Is one stronger than another? Well, that's a subject people have been arguing an awful lot. Um, it's certainly true that European swords, with their um, tempering process that they go through, tend to be a little bit more flexible, can absorb a bit more energy. Um, whereas a lot of tests in the katana, they have either broken blades or essentially broken the spine of them. Um, but 
there's still not enough like for like tests to say for sure. I think you'll find for the most part it's going to come down to how heavy is the blade. If it's a 600 gram lightweight katana then it's going to break fairly easily and if it's a sort of 1.1 kilo kind of thing you're going to take into battle then no it's going to be rather sturdy. So in terms of durability um, again it's really going to come down to the individual sword and not comparing one to the other. So not an awful lot of difference. Uh, then on to the folding process which is another thing which people talk a lot about with the katana. Now this one isn't folded for the simple reason that um, the lower end range of handways they don't bother. And the reason they don't bother is well, one to keep the cost down and two because they don't need to. Folding was a process that was done to um, get the purities out of the metal and get a higher quality of steel. With modern uh, steels that the, Jap the Japanese now have and, and actual with the Chinese that make things like the handways, they don't need to fold the katanas. It's still done for tradition. Now folding of blades is something that was done across the world or a large parts of the world. It was done in Europe, um, it was done throughout parts of the Middle East and the Far East. And you tend to find that it lasted where they wanted to maintain a tradition or actual particular look of a blade. But it's not necessary, um, uh, at least anymore. And at the time when the katana was being used, um, in Europe it certainly wasn't necessary to be folding blades at the time. We had access to high quality steels and alloys. So, the folding process doesn't make it stronger, inher inherently stronger than what was available in Europe. The next thing I want to talk about is the speed. Now, there is this idea that the katana is lightning fast, and you can largely blame video games for that one, um, or, or and movies for that matter. Again, you've got this idea of the hulking sort of European swords being thrown around like they're sort of caveman clubs, and the agile katana being flipped around as if it's a lightsaber. Um, there is no inherent difference between the speed of one or other. If you proportionally had a katana of this size and a European sword, a long sword that was on average five or six inches longer, you might find the katana has a slight uh, advantage in speed because it just is smaller. But that, if you compare like for like size wise, you're going to find no difference at all because the weight's the same, there's nothing much in it. So they're not inherently quick or fast compared to the European sword. Um, onto the curvature. Um, there are endless arguments as to which blades are best, straight or curved, and you'll see it throughout history and you'll see it today, all the time. And I can indeed begin to answer that question in this video, or maybe any video, is that there are advantages and disadvantages to curvature. The one thing that can be said for it is the curve of a blade will assist with the actual slicing action of a blade. So doing test cutting with a katana, for example, is an awful lot easier than test cutting with a straight blade. You actually need a lot more precision to be able to cut with a straight blade, which isn't to say that somebody trained with a katana couldn't do it. They practiced their cutting extensively, or at least a number did. So uh, the curvature does help, but again, there are an awful lot of European curved blades. They are curved long swords, there are an awful lot of sabers. So there's no real sort of comparison to be made there. There's straight blades and curved blades throughout most cultures in the world. Um, hand protection is a point that in our videos often gets mentioned. Yes, the katana doesn't have a lot of hand protection and you'll see they do use the sword appropriately for the fact that it doesn't have a lot of hand protection. Um, European swords are varied immensely so I can't begin to compare that at this stage. That's going to have to be individually based on the time period and the sword we're going to look at. Um, the ability to be wielded one or two-handed. Um, this katana, this handway, is actually quite long on the grip for, for its overall size, but even so, the katana is intended to be used two-handed, and sources will uh, historically mention the use of it in one hand uh, for particular techniques, and also so that other things can be in the offhand, such as uh, a wakasashi, so a shorter Japanese sword, or another katana. Um, Again, the Europeans had swords that did exactly that. We call them hand and a half or bastard swords, which are in between. They're not fully two-handed, they can be used two-handed, and they're light enough and short enough that they can be used in one hand. So again, you'll see that kind of thing all the way through the medieval period and through the Renaissance, all different kinds of hilts. Um, there's no doubt that it's a compromise. Um, if you want to use a sword one-handed with a long grip, it is a disadvantage over using a one-handed sword in one hand. Um, this becomes a little unwieldy, having this grip, and the angles and rotations you can get at the wrist are slightly restricted, so 
that's no different to the equivalent uh, European sword that did the same thing. Now, um, I've already talked about against armor. The katana has no advanced dual bar armor over really any other sword. Um, so that, that's sort of besides the point. And on to um, where it really excels. Okay. A lot of Japanese systems put a massive focus on drawing um, the actual sword itself and cutting with the draw. And this is something you do see in a few European manuals, but it's not anywhere near as common. And yes, obviously a sword that is relatively small like this um, is very good for that particular technique, cutting from the draw. So it's quick on the draw, which sometimes can obviously be a good thing. It's also going to be good in confined spaces, again, depending on the size. But if you're talking about something like this, yes, it's going to be a little better in confined spaces than some of the sort of equivalent um, sort of European swords, that's, that, that's true. Um, the evolution of the sword. Often people will cite the idea that the katana reached its sort of evolutionary perfection, like a shark, um, because it remained relatively unchanged for hundreds and hundreds of years. And therefore it's implied or suggested that therefore it is exceptional, it reached its evolutionary peak. And maybe it did and maybe it didn't. Um, the one thing you could say about Europeans is they had a lot more outside influences and the weapons evolved for what they were being used for as well as culturally why they were being used and how they were being carried and by who. Um, so certainly because a weapon lasted as long as the katana in a comparatively isolated um, sort of region as Japan, it might be that it was exceptional for the job it's doing, which it probably is to be honest, um, or it might be that it's a tradition and you will find endless arguments for both sides there, so I won't go into that one. Um, in terms of, as a summary, how does it compare to European swords? Well, there's no doubt the katana is an exceptional sword. And the reason I wanted to talk to you about it today is because we've done a lot of videos on the katana, uh, sparring videos, comparing it to the sabre, the longsword, the rapier, and people take from it different things. Um, if you watch our videos, you'll see the katana winning on some videos, you'll see it losing on others. It depends who's wielding the sword, who they're fighting against, the quality of the two fighters, there's all kinds of factors. Uh, and we have to remember that ultimately the most important factor is the quality of the person using the sword. Um, but yeah, how does it compare to a European sword? What makes it so special? Well, it's no more special than the majority of sword designs that were adopted around the world that lasted a great length of time. Um, it obviously did the job well. It's a well-respected and well-regarded sword. It just isn't the sort of lightsaber ultimate sword that people might think it is, and no sword is. So there you have it. An exceptionally fine design, a very good sword, um, and exceptionally good at what it does. And we will cover some more specific videos looking at the katana versus particularly European swords uh, quite soon, and we will put up a lot more sparring footage. And if you've got any ideas of what you'd like to see compared to it or used against, then please post and comment. And please subscribe so that you see more videos in the future. Thanks.